Okay, so yeah, I'm going to take this kind of clinicals. I'm just going to talk about magnetic fields and how to go to the earth and make a build for their role with the great monsters. Ah, thanks, Catherine. Um, morning, everyone. Well done for being here. Uh, I'm sure a few of us, it's a bit touch and go whether we were going to make it. Um, so this is a talk kind of in two parts. So the first part is more of a kind of proposal and an idea I want to take forward. Um, and I thought you were the perfect audience to kind of run it by and see what everyone thinks. And then in the second half, I'll talk a bit more about some of the data um, and kind of proof of concept, how this, how this might work. Um, so just a brief outline um, of what I'll talk through. So I'll start by introducing band and iron formations in the Great Oxidation Event, um, what they are, when they happen, why we should care about them. Um, then why I think the magnetic field may have had a role to play. Um, and then I will preach to the converters that recovering old magnetic field records is really difficult. Um, and then some solutions potentially to getting around uh, getting very, very old paleo intensities um, and how we might go about doing this in the future. Okay, so just to start with, um, so introducing uh, band and iron formations first. So band and iron formations are basically um, very extensive marine deposits um, that were um, deposited in the oceans prior to the rise in oxygen. So they're, they're deposited mostly in anoxic conditions. Um, so this is before two and a half billion years ago. You basically have um, iron rich clays um, and oxyhydroxide raining out of the water column being deposited on the seafloor and then sometime later, that turns into a banded iron formation as we know it today, which is basically layers of quartz and then microsite, lucite, jasper, that kind of thing. Um, and so they were deposited before the great oxidation event when we had quite a, an anoxic atmosphere. And actually they then continue to be deposited after the, um, after the oxidation event, but in kind of localized settings. Um, so for example, during glaciation, if you can if you can block off a body of water, you can stop oxygen getting to it, and then you can produce banded iron formations even less than a, a billion years ago. So these are really, really interesting deposits to look at because they have been deposited so continuously throughout time, and they are absolutely chock a block full of magnetic minerals. Um, so potentially a good target, but the magnetite in them is not primary. Um, and so I will talk later on about why that's a challenge and how we, how we might get around that. So anyway, now that the, the great oxidation event, so this is an event that happened around two and a half billion years ago. Um, and so the blue curve here um, shows you basically the, the oxygen levels in the atmosphere before the great oxidation event and then, and then after it. So we have a huge spike, many orders of magnitude, increase in the atmospheric oxygen levels. Um, and so this is this is a well-known signal. Lots and lots of studies have looked at this. this um, there's, there's some debate about these wiggles afterwards, but we know there was a big rise here. Um, but the other interesting thing that was happening basically at the same time is that your xenon isotopes, um, so these are measured in, in inclusions in minerals, are decreasing up until the point that we get this rise in oxygen. And that turns out to actually be really, really important. So what that's telling us is that xenon was escaping from the atmosphere up until the point where oxygen increased in the atmosphere and then that oxidizes all your xenon, it can't escape anymore, okay? Um, so some geochemistry for us, it's taken me a long time to get my head around what this, what this means. And so that's been a really big problem for people who care about atmospheres and how chemical elements escape from an atmosphere because xenon is very heavy. Okay, so things like krypton is lighter than xenon, but krypton hasn't escaped, but xenon has. Um, the only difference between them is xenon is easily ionized. Okay, so you can easily make xenon charged. Um, and that's interesting because if you make it charged, it becomes sensitive to magnetic field lines. Um, and so there is a kind of growing consensus that the way to get rid of your xenon is to basically drag it out along Earth's magnetic field lines along with um, hydrogen. And of course, if you remove lots of hydrogen, that has the effect of oxidizing the atmosphere. So actually, rather than having an increase in oxygen, you have a decrease in hydrogen. And that can then explain the xenon record and the, um, the oxygen record um, in our atmosphere through time. Um, so these are a couple of mechanisms for how you can get hydrogen and xenon to escape. So basically polar wind escape. Um, so that's where you have open magnetic field lines that are connected to space. And so basically once you've got ions along those, that's like a motorway to get out of the atmosphere. Um, or you can have cusp escape, which is basically where 
the, the edge of the magnetic field interacts with the solar wind. And so where the two interact strongly here, you can also have all of your, um, your ions escaping out of the atmosphere. Um, and so this is a model basically showing how, but depending on your magnetic field strength, if it's weak, polar escape will dominate. You have lots and lots of hydrogen escape. If it's very strong, then cusp, cusp escape will dominate, um, but never, never so much. So basically weak magnetic fields allow lots of efficient escape along the, the poles. Um, so that's, that's really the important thing here. And so that's kind of interesting if you think about whether this is a plausible mechanism for causing the GOE and you look at our paleo intensity record through time. Um, and I've plotted this in a slightly peculiar way. So we've got paleo intensity on a log scale. Um, so we can compare it basically to these, these escape mechanisms. Um, so essentially this gray area is everywhere that we would have lots of polar escape. Um, and so basically I'm really, really interested to know have we ever had a time period prior to the GOE where we can say with statistical significance that the field was significantly weak or, or weak enough for this, this escape mechanism um, to work? So that's really the, the big question. Um, and this is something that I um, have started to work on with a wonderful group of mostly electrical engineers, uh, because it turns out weirdly they're the ones that have all the amazing models of how the magnetic field um, interacts with, with ionized particles. Um, so yeah, so if you're interested in doing atmospheric escape and thinking about how to take magnetic fields into account, don't go to physics, go to electrical engineering. Um, so these guys have been very, very useful in kind of helping me get this project um, off the ground um, and thinking about it. Um, in, a, in a lot more detail and not having to do all the, the scary physics myself. So, okay, so just to kind of summarize what we know about the, the geological record um, through time, so it's just a very, very simplified plot. So we've got time um, basically running along the top and I've split this into essentially, um, so very old, so basically where we have no, rec no rock record and no idea when we had life before three and a half billion years ago. Then 2.8 to three and a half billion years ago, so prior to, prior to the GOE, when we think that hydrogen and xenon both have to be escaping from the atmosphere. And then 2.3 to 2.5 is basically the, the, the GOE, um, where we have this, this increase in oxygen. So this is my simplified kind of idea of what's happening. So hydrogen and xenon are uh, going down and then oxygen is basically constant and then starts going up. And so if this is, true, if these observations that we have on the chemistry are right, then this means that actually the only way we can explain this with atmospheric escape models at the moment is by having a weak magnetic field in the, the kind of grey and brown region. That's the, the only way we can, we can really make this work. And that's completely at odds with the existing paleo intensity record as sparse as it is. Um, so if we look at single crystal paleo intensities, which make up most of the record for this time, I'm not going to go into whether we think they're you know, reliable or not. But it's rather interesting that actually the magnetic field seems to get stronger at exactly the time when we need it to get weaker. So this is at complete odds. Um, and we just don't know from whole, whole rock experiments, there's about three in this entire time period. Um, so if the single crystal data are correct, then there's something we really don't understand about atmospheric escape. And if the single crystal data are not correct, then we've got an awful lot of work to do to figure out what the magnetic field was doing in this time period. Um, so this is really what I think we should all go after um, in the next few years to, to figure out. I think it's really interesting to see if we can, we can link paleo intensities to, to potential atmospheric escape. Um, but yeah, I guess to quickly transition into why this is so difficult and why we haven't done it yet. I know that you all know this. Um, but yeah, Precambrian rocks are a real pain to work on um, because, well, they've had very complex geological histories, right? They've been altered by metamorphism, metasomatism, all sorts of events multiple times in their histories. And so that means that when we measure them, we don't know when they were microcised, right? It's definitely not the crystallization age um, or depositional age of the rock. And we also don't know um, how a CRM compares to a, a TRM, right? So even if we can extract a you know, some sort of paleo intensity value. We have no idea how to calibrate that and get a, a realistic value out. So they're a problem. Um, and so, yeah, let's talk about the age of magnetization um, first. So I guess you'll mostly all be very familiar with doing paleomagnetic field tests, right? So this is kind of how we, how we verify the age of our sample. Okay, so we can do things like fake contact tests. 
And if you see the magnetization uh, direction change between an intrusion and the surrounding rock, then you know that this, this magnetization must be older than the age of the intrusion. But in metamorphic terrains, which is most of the Precambrian, these tests fail. And so at the moment, that means we then throw all that data away because we're like, well, okay, it's an overprint, we don't care. But this overprint might still be really old and really, really helpful. We just then need another way of actually getting an age from it. Uh, and so I've been working on banded iron formations um, from Ishua in Greenland. Uh, and while I was reading the literature, preparing to go look at them, I came across a paper which has actually done uranium lead dating on magnetite um, in these bits. Uh, and it's paper in the late 90s. Um, and they were kind of equally surprised by their own results. Uh, the title of the paper is something like Controversial Lead Lead Age for Magnetite. Um, and so what they found, they measured magnetite in the, the bands and also in a vein that cross cuts the bands. Um, and they found that the, the magnetite in the bands has a slightly older age, as you would expect from that textual relationship. And the age they get is about 3.7 billion years, um, and that's also been um, independently verified by bulk rock um, geochronology on these rocks and also by looking at um, the appetites. So it's quite surprising they kind of did this, and then no one really followed up. Um, and the reason that this kind of didn't take off as an idea was because no one had any idea of the closure temperature of this system. It's not something we usually use as a geochronometer. So even though we can get an age from the microsite, we have no idea how that relates uh, to the curing temperature and when this thing got magnetized. Um, so that's a bit of a problem. Um, so we uh, decided this would be a very, very interesting thing to pursue, because obviously if we can date microsite, that's great for the magnetists. Um, so we measured the average grain size of the magnetite in this BIF. Um, so we basically do that by doing liquid nitrogen dunks. We make everything very cold. We see how much of the multi-domain signal um, disappears from our rock. And that basically gives you um, a, a rough idea of the, the grain size of your magnetite. So the magnetite in these samples is basically between about one and 20 microns in diameter um, on, on average. Uh, and then we measure the, uh, the diffusion rate of lead in magnetite crystals. Um, and so now using the grain size and the diffusion rate, we actually can work out the closure temperature um, for a given grain size and a given cooling rate. So if we consider quite slow cooling rates um, that you might expect in a, in a metamorphic terrain, then what we're showing is that the closure temperatures for this bit at least will be below 400 and in some cases actually just above 100 degrees C. And so that's telling us that because these grains recover an age of nearly 3.7 billion years, they haven't been above relatively low temperatures since they recorded that age. If they'd been heated to 400 degrees C, the age would be reset, the age would be younger. So actually this is really, really important because it's telling us that these rocks since 3.7 billion years ago have really not experienced extensive heat at all. Um, so actually the magnetization is 3.7 billion years old um, based on the, the lead lead age. Um, and so we can now use this to actually tackle bad iron formations, which haven't really been used for paleomagnetism in the past because of this problem that the magnetite is secondary. OK, so we don't know if it's formed during diagenesis or during metamorphism or during many, many metamorphic events. But now we can go and do this to other banded iron formations and we know the age of magnetization in our samples. And BIFs are also actually surprising, well, they have kind of surprising rock magnetic properties. Um, so I came uh, to, to use Rich's BSM um, a couple of years ago and measured some samples, thinking, I know there's something stable in these. Uh, so, you know, let's get some nice fork diagrams that show me exactly what I want. It didn't. They all just looked multi domain and horrible. Um, but interestingly, if you look at the coercivity spectra, you see we have this big multi domain signal, so a big low coercivity peak shown in red. But there is something very, very high coercivity um, up here shown in, in blue, which I think is a very small population of single domain magnetite, which is not seeing in the fourth diagram because it's being swamped by that multi domain signal. Um, so that's something I need to think about in more detail. I would like to know what people think. Um, but I think there's definitely, there's definitely something stable um, and high with a high coercivity. In these, in these rocks. Um, and that's also kind of confirmed by uh, the way that they, they demag. We get really nice, um, stable demagnetization of these samples, nice stable origin trending components between 400 and 580 degrees C. 
and they all point in a similar direction. So this is showing um, results from, from one outcrop of BIF um, and several, several drill calls, and we're, we're starting to recover nice directions. Um, and the directions I'm showing you here in pink actually corresponds to the directions shown here in yellow um, and do form part of a, a past big contact test. Um, there's a fair bit of scatter here, but it passes with 90% confidence. Um, and we think the scatter is actually to do with the fact that it's acquiring CRM over a long period of time. Um, so we think this is actually, it's capturing kind of secular variation rather than anisotropy, which is what we've talked previously. So this is all looking very promising um, and is also consistent with the uranium lineage that we have for this site. Everything is, oh, I forgot to say for the bait contact test, the, um, the dike here is, is 3.5 billion years old. So the fact that this passes is telling us that it's got to be older than 3.5. And then based on our uranium lead age, we think it's probably, um, probably 3.7. Um, so I guess the next big thing that I think well, I want to work on, I know other people in this room are working on, um, is figuring out actually how we can now solve the CRM problem. So now if we can get a reliable age, we can also work out how to calibrate our CRM, we can start filling in this rather large gap, depending on some all the grey ones here are just single crystals, okay, so take them or leave them, that's up to you. Um, but we've got a lot of work to do, I think, in this time period, if we really want to understand whether um, the magnetic field has ever done anything to atmospheric escape um, throughout Earth's history. And I have run out of time, so I'll sit my conclusions up and finish there. Thank you. Um, questions? Yeah, Frank? Um, that was a really interesting talk. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Interesting How critical is your estimate of the closer temperature on your estimate of the green suns? Oh yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Yeah, so as long as you know your brain size, you can calculate your closure temperature, but you do need to know what your brain size is. Um, the nice thing is the larger brains are usually better for the geochronology. Um, so the ones that actually aren't giving you a magnetic signal will give you an, an age estimate. And the smaller the grains, the higher, is that right? Let me go back to my slide. Yeah, so the, the smaller grains will give you a lower and lower temperature. So the larger grains will tell you kind of the, the maximum temperature is, is hit. Um, yeah, but you do need to know grain size. Yeah. One more, anyone from the back or? <laughs> 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 Chemistry question, I'm sort of my lack of knowledge here. Um, you mentioned right at the beginning uh, the xenon bonding or reacting with oxygen. Yeah. How I thought xenon was basically unreactive, or is it something with different pressure and temperature conditions then? Or? Uh, well, for starters, you're kind of asking the wrong person. I'm definitely not a chemist, but I think xenon is very reactive with xenon, would much rather be xenon oxide or whatever that is than, than xenon on its own. Um, yeah, so as soon as you have any oxygen, it would rather bond to that than the other side. Okay, I, yeah. I, I thought it didn't be yeah. I think that's true. Someone in the room might know better than me. That's, that's not my... You may say yeah. you're not a chemist, you're still more involved. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Pretty. <laughs> 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 it looks like you're going to ask a really slight question. <laughs> <laughs> Just, just a technical question on the dating the magnetite. I mean, mm. when you do this spatially resolved, and, 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 and what, how little magnetite do you need to get? Yeah, so we're doing this with BGS at the moment. So we're mapping out in individual magnetite grains where the radio lead is because it's it's a bit of a controversial system in terms of we don't think there's much radiogenic lead in there and we don't know where the is. So we're doing mapping, lead relation mapping at the moment um, of individual grains. So kind of similar to what people do with carbonates. So you basically can get it spatially resolved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Individual grain scale. Yeah, so you can you can map out an individual grain and map out your, your uranium and lead distribution within a single a single magnetite crystal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you really know what that was Tim's, wasn't it? Yeah, the original the original was Tim's. Yeah. 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 And then you know where to go with Tim's, and then you get more accurate. So watch this space. Yes. Cool. Well, thanks, man. Um, so, I'll